All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so, right, my name is Brad Chambers. Uh, I work for a small consulting company called uh, Grover Consulting Services. Uh, but as, as Mike mentioned, I have uh, worked uh, and contributed to Poodle for, I think, over 10 years at this point. Um, so, and by the way, great, great talk, Howard. Always uh, entertaining listening to you. A little tough to follow you, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys will, will enjoy this talk. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about semantic segmentation, and I would invite any of you, um, if you missed it, uh, there was another talk earlier today um, from Auslandia. It was an online session um, where they also talked a little bit about point cloud semantic segmentation, and it had a lot more in the way of kind of background on what exactly is the task and some of the different models and methods that are available. So um, I don't know when those videos or slides become available, but I would encourage you to go and, and look that one up. So today, uh, the, the point of the talk is going to be to, again, just briefly describe what is the problem and what are we trying to do when we talk about uh, semantic segmentation of point clouds. Um, and we will be looking also uh, specifically at some, some benchmark data sets uh, that are available and also some of the metrics that are typically used to measure performance uh, of this particular task. Uh, and then we will spend most of the time talking about some of the open, uh, open implementations that are available, um, and, and you won't be surprised to find that there's a, a heavy emphasis on some of the things that Poodle can do to, um, to make this a little bit easier. So this is just an example. This tweet was uh, actually, I think, a year old yesterday, uh, where I was uh, showing uh, an example of, of highlighting building uh, points uh, in the point cloud alone. And so you can see those are, are highlighted in kind of this uh, orange-red color. And then there's another one here where it's uh, highlighting the vegetation. And so semantic segmentation really is, is just the process of assi uh, assigning a semantic label to each of the points in the point cloud. In the raster do domain, this would be labeling each pixel in the raster. It's really the same concept. Um, now, so in, uh, in LAS land, there is uh, kind of this predefined set of some labels. Um, and so, uh, you know, typically the most common ones that people talk about are ground, building, and, and vegetation. Uh, but there are others, right? You can get into water classes, bridge decks, um, and then people might be interested, if their data supports it, into going further into things that the LES spec doesn't necessarily cover, uh, like vehicles, um, power lines, that type of thing. And, and when you start doing that type of um, classification, you end up getting into working with custom classes. So there's not really anything um, that's unified or, or widely accepted for, for, for some of those. But they are also kind of in the weeds. Uh, a lot of times um, it, it can be a little bit tricky to, to train uh, the tools to, to detect those classes. So the basic uh, metric that, that we will be looking at, uh, or one of them, uh, I guess the most intuitive one for a lot of people is to talk about the overall accuracy. And this really is just kind of a percentage of the, you know, the total number of correctly classified points uh, divided by the total number of points. Uh, the problem with this is that if you are after some of those classes that are um, perhaps underrepresented and smaller in number, um, you know, your performance on a particular class gets kind of lost and, 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 and it's, it's hard to tell how well you're actually performing. Um, and so for that reason, what we often look at actually is this, uh, this uh, metric called the intersection over union. And so that's just looking at uh, exactly as it sounds, the intersection of those truth labels uh, with your predicted ones um, divided by the union of, of, of all of those um, for that particular class. And so that way you can hone in on performance of individually all of your ground labels, all of your buildings, all of your vegetation, et cetera. Um, and it's still common then to take that and take the mean over it and report a mean intersection over union score. Okay. So um, in terms of benchmark data sets, um, the, the two that I, I really am focusing on in this talk, and, and they're not the only ones out there, um, but these are the ones that are, are most closely aligned with uh, aerial LIDAR surveys, which is what I, particularly, I mostly deal with myself. Um, there are others that might be more room scans um, and, and some very you know, uh, you know, um, 
you know, mainstream benchmark data sets like ModelNet and ScanNet and uh, S3DIS. There, there are quite a few out there. And a lot of the libraries and frameworks that you'll find for point cloud semantic segmentation will reference those other, um, those benchmarks. Uh, these two are, are a little bit newer. They're not brand new. I'd say they're both within the past um, probably two or three years. Uh, so US3D is, uh, comes from a US Cities collection um, that's, that's uh, available. And they picked two, uh, two sites, um, one in Jacksonville and one in Omaha. And this is, they've got a large number of training tiles but it's a relatively low point density. And so if you think back to Howard's chart, actually, about how you know, these point densities are, are beginning to kind of skyrocket, uh, this kind of represents what would have been mainstream. And actually, I think this data was collected closer to 10 years ago. Um, so it's a relatively uh, low resolution, but there's still plenty of this type of data that you might find out um, you know, publicly available or, 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 or not necessarily even public. But, you know, data was often collected at this resolution. Um, and you know, as we mentioned, those classes uh, really tend to be mostly saturated in, in like ground, vegetation, and building. Th those alone are easily like 90% of the entire data set. Um, this, this did uh, strive to also classify uh, points as either water or bridge. And then there are some that are still reserved as, as simply unlabeled. Uh, Dales is, is much higher density. Um, this was a, a survey done uh, with a Regal sensor in Canada, um, closer to 25 points for, per square meter. Um, but it still shows kind of the same story where we've got ground and vegetation and building really dominating um, most, of the, most of the labels in the point cloud. Uh, there are some others, and this is a, a good example of where we get into some of the non-standard uh, classes of cars, trucks, uh, even fences. Uh, but, but they're really much smaller numbers. All of those together were less than 2% than of the entire uh, data set. So uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm really gonna be focused on US3D. That's where I've done uh, most of my work. And so tools, um, there are, uh, you know, there are some frameworks out there and we're beginning to see some more uh, development of tools that are publicly available uh, as open source software uh, for semantic segmenta segmentation. Um, and so Open3D uh, has a ma machine learning um, kind of sub project called Open3D ML. Um, there's also PyG, uh, which uh, is PyTorch Geometric. Um, and these do a really good job of, of taking kind of, uh, you know, state-of-the-art algorithms and keeping relatively current with what we might be seeing in, in the literature. And so there's all sorts of models in there that, that, you, can, that, you, can, uh, that you can train on uh, where they kind of have, um, you know, where some of the drawbacks exist are that they really seem to be focused more um, on uh, like academic um, or robotics applications. You see lots of, um, lots of data sets uh, and readers and writers uh, for still ASCII data, uh, PCD, uh, PLY. And, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the benchmarks that they're measuring themselves against, again, are those kind of more mainstream, not aerial LIDAR survey uh, benchmarks. Um, so what does Poodle bring to the table? So. Uh, as I, I would guess many here already know, uh, the Poodle users in the room, uh, we have the flexibility of supporting those many file formats. And so we can still support ASCII, PCD, these types of things that people have been using uh, historically in, in, in you know, some of the past research and the, the other frameworks that you would uh, find. Um, but we also have that support for LAS, LAZ, as Howard mentioned, you know, that when we get into the kind of the open data holdings, um, you know, that's where really all of this aerial LiDAR data, um, that, that's how it's encoded. Um, and then Poodle, of course, does have support for reading COPSI as well. Um, Poodle also brings to the table the ability to manipulate and generate certain features. And so while you can do machine learning with just, um, you know, some basic information, you know, coordinates, maybe intensity, stuff that's just, um, natively available to the point cloud. Uh, there's a lot of power and also being able to manipulate it. And so Ferry is up there because you can kind of rename and shuffle around uh, some of the dimensions uh, in, in Poodle speak. 
Uh, assign would allow you to adjust things so you can rescale data or, or do certain kind of uh, you know, algebraic operations on combination of dimensions. And, and then create is, is this, this whole um, separate idea of being able to generate new features uh, from the data itself. And so a lot of these are geometric features taken from point cloud neighborhoods, um, you know, eigenvalues, normals, uh, and these covariance features which people often see um, you know, you, you'll see in a lot of the literature where they talk about estimation of linearity, planarity, uh, sphericity, and verticality. And so those, those are all uh, computed by Poodle. And Poodle doesn't internally uh, support any machine learning on its own, uh, but it does have a real strength in that the, t the, Python, bind, or the Python ties are already there uh, through the Poodle filter and through the Poodle Python bindings. And so while Python is certainly not the only name in the game when it comes to machine learning, um, there, is clearly a, there are clearly a lot of people, um, be it in you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Open3D, um, PyG, uh, all of these kind of mainstream libraries are, are really rooted in Python. Um, so there's, there's an, an easy connect there to, to do some neat things. So backing up a little bit, actually, uh, you know, back one of the first filters that I probably uh, contributed myself to Poodle was this thing called PMF. It was the Progressive Morphological Filter. Um, we later followed that up with Smurf, which is a simple morphological filter, and then CSF is the cloth simulation filter. And all of these were focused on discriminating between ground and non-ground points. And you know, that alone is, it's, it is a form of semantic segmentation, right? And we've already seen that it, it addresses, you know, a majority of the points, like 60-ish percent um, or higher in, in many data sets. Um, and so there's already a, a big bang for your buck in, in just doing that alone. Um, and it's also kind of foundational to other things that you might want to do, whether it be height above ground um, or other things. Um, then we also, over time, and we, I've already mentioned a few of these, but we, we started developing more primitives, or these are some of those features that you can calculate based off of the data. So again, that's, that's eigenvalues and normals or, or the height above ground. And out of that, we actually saw, uh, this was a separate work that was posted probably a couple of years ago, um, but there's a slide deck and a Python notebook that you can go and look at but they actually took a lot of those kind of stock Poodle filters and built up a classifier just based on some pretty simple heuristics um, to be able to do ground building and vegetation. And if we take um, you know, what they provided at the time and write it in more modern uh, Poodle using the, the newest Python bindings, this is really uh, all it looks like. Um, and so it's taking uh, an EPT data source uh, running Smurf to get, get the ground labels, computing a height above ground, then uh, computing uh, eigenvalues, and using those, uh, those, uh, those dimensions, it's just looking at, at some simple kind of conditions. So one of them is they're asserting that uh, things are likely to be trees if they were still unclassified after the ground uh, segmentation step. I guess, can you see the, the mouse there? Yeah. And if the height above ground was greater than, equal, um, uh, greater than or equal to two meters, uh, if the eigenvalue, the smallest eigenvalue was, was larger than a, a set uh, number, and then if the number of returns minus the return number was something greater than one. Um, and so if you can kind of wrap your head all around that, it all, it all kind of makes sense, um, as this might be something that, rec or that, that represented a tree because it was tall enough, the data was kind of scattered, and it was in an area that did have multiple returns, but it also wasn't the last return. Um, similarly, you can take kind of those, those same, that same short list of dimensions and come up with a, a crude classifier for, for the roof, right? Those points that were unclassified, um, here they, had, they must have been looking for tall buildings because it was over seven meters. Um, they were looking for small eigenvalues and they were looking for it to be a situation in which these were points that were last returns. Um, and using that, you know, they just, they output it to LAS. So uh, I actually took that and modified it slightly to run with the, with the US 3D data set that I mentioned earlier and, and looked at it a couple of ways. So the first was just measuring the overall accuracy in, in the mean intersection over union 
for only that three cl class case, which it was actually designed for, uh, so building vegetation and ground. And, and you can see that, you know, they're maybe fair scores. Uh, the overall accuracy is like in the 80% kind of range and the intersection over union is, is pretty low. Um, and then if you, you know, extend that to all five classes, which for US 3D added water and bridge, unsurprisingly, those numbers, especially the intersection over union scores, go way down um, because it was never designed to detect those. Um, but this does also highlight, you know, we don't see nearly as much of a drop in the, the overall accuracy because those, those classes were so small to begin with. They just don't uh, really impact the, the score um, significantly. Uh, so more recently, we had done some work using a more modern, uh, true machine learning um, uh, approach called KPConf, and um, you know, kind of what I determined to be roughly state of the art anyway uh, at the time I did the study, which was about a year ago. Um, but linking that up against Poodle so that we had support for LAS, uh, resampling of the data, and some of this feature generation. Um, it can be pretty simply installed. Um, I'm a big Conda user, and so this is an example of the Conda environment. That's, that's all that's needed to get everything uh, installed uh, on the system and up and running. Um, here is the GitHub repo uh, where I have my code, um, which is really just modifications of the original author's uh, own PyTorch code. Uh, this isn't necessarily meant to be uh, pretty code, uh, and, and if you take a look at it, uh, it might be a bit frustrating in places, but it was really done as a proof of concept to show that it could, it could be done. Um, so that's out there. And I'll, I'll just summarize, I mean, the, the key changes are there is an LAS data set um, that, that needs to be defined, and um, because, again, before it was, they weren't handling LAS at all. And so some of the things that we add to that are we define some of these additional classes that are specific to the LAS spec, and then we actually can go in and tell it which of those classes to ignore. Um, because just because LAS specifies all of these doesn't mean that we have the data to support it or that we're going to make any attempt to, to learn um, some of the smaller classes. Um, so that list that you see there limits it to just the, the five classes that I mentioned earlier. And then there's a, a, an LAS reader in the utils folder. And, and again, this is just, um, it's using Poodle's uh, more modern Python bindings. So it's, it's reading the file name, um, limiting it to points that actually do fall within that range. Um, I think there might have been some other points that had kind of erroneous, kind of weird classifications. And so I just tossed them um, out at the beginning. It computes these covariance features, which is the linearity and verticality, those things that I mentioned earlier, and then uses uh, Poodle's Poisson filter to downsample it so that no two points are any closer to one meter uh, to one another. And it takes all of these dimensions, stacks them up into NumPy arrays, and passes it back out. And then from there, it's, it's really able to use all of the stock stuff that came with the original uh, KPConf implementation. And so what we see here is that um, you know, we, we've you know, reiterated the, the heuristics there on the top line, um, and we can see that with uh, KPConf and, and Poodle, we're now up in the you know, upper 90% for overall classification, both in the three, uh, three class and five class uh, problems. And our mean intersection over union scores are, are significantly higher, both up in the 90s as well. Um, and the last one there is, is just um, just kind of a data point. So DPNet was the top performing uh, algorithm uh, for the paper that was written uh, for this US 3D benchmark. Um, so we don't have a lot of information about that algorithm. I've never tried to run it myself, um, but that's kind of you know the the 0.945 mean intersection over union was you know that was the best at least a, a couple of years ago. And so we're we're up there close to it. Um, you know, running like 500 iterations, I think, on a, on a desktop machine. Um, so, you know, presumably we could maybe do better if we did some more hyperparameter tuning and longer runs and all of this, but uh, I think it's reasonable um, the way we are right there. So I'll just wrap it up to say, um, you know, I, I think some of my own desires to see out of um, kind of the community at large is, a, I mean, especially within the machine learning community, which isn't necessarily who this audience is, but 
I would like to see more adoption, broader adoption across um, uh, the community of, of Poodle so that we don't have to do this work after the fact to kind of hook it up and get all the benefits of being able to support the different data formats um, and, and generate uh, you know, the features. I mean, so much of that is already provided. People don't need to be you know, rewriting it themselves. Um, I'd also like to see the same authors or, or future um, uh, semantic segmentation model uh, authors publishing results uh, against US3D and, and Dales um, so that, you know, that, uh, you know, the aerial LIDAR survey um, community can kind of have an un understanding of, okay, great, I see how it performs against like the Stanford, Stanford Bundy and all that, but this is how it might perform against data that I'm actually using in my own job. Um, and then I think there's also some real interesting things that we've, we've just not really begun to look at in terms of connecting some of these methods and models uh, with COPSI and being able to really look then into wide scale uh, inference of, of these semantic segmentation labels um, based off of you know, very massive point cloud data sets. And with that, that's my talk, if there's any questions.